Hello friends and welcome to my channel. In this video, we will be learning about the anatomy of the diaphragm. To begin with, the diaphragm is a dome-shaped muscle forming the partition between the thoracic and abdominal cavities, as you can see right here, as well as in this diagram. Now, it is the chief muscle of respiration. The muscle fibers form the periphery of the partition and they arise from the circumference of the thoracic outlet and are inserted into a central tendon, as you can see right here. The diaphragm also gives passage to a number of structures between the thoracic and abdominal cavities that pass in both the directions. Now let's look at the origin of the diaphragm. The muscle fibers are grouped into three parts, that is the sternal, the costal and the lumbar part. We will be looking at each of these parts in detail in the next diagram. Now here in this diagram we can see the inferior aspect of the diaphragm, the ribs and the coastal cartilages, the cephoid process, the lumbar vertebrae and the muscles that is the quadratus lumborum muscle and the psoas major muscle. Now let us look at the sternal part, coastal and the lumbar part of the diaphragm in detail. Firstly looking at the sternal part. It arises by two fleshy slips from the back of the cephoid process right here. Next looking at the coastal part of the diaphragm, it arises from the inner surfaces of the cartilages and the adjacent parts of the lower six ribs on each side. Next looking at the lumbar part, it arises from the medial and lateral lumbar coastal arches and from the lumbar vertebrae by the right and left crura. Now here is the medial lumbocostal arch, it is also called the medial arcuate ligament right here and here. And then here is the lateral lumbocostal arch right here, it is also called the lateral arcuate ligament. And also here is the lumbar vertebrae and this is the right crura and left crura. So the lumbar part arises from these structures. Now, under the introduction, we had learned that the diaphragm is a dome-shaped muscle forming the partition between the thoracic and abdominal cavities. It is a chief muscle of respiration. The muscle fibers form the periphery of the partition. They arise from the circumference of the thoracic outlet and are inserted into a central tendon. The diaphragm also gives passage to a number of structures between the thoracic and abdominal cavities that pass in both the directions. Under the origin, we learned that the muscle fibers are grouped into three parts, the sternal, coastal and lumbar part. The sternal part arises by two fleshy slips from the back of the cephoid process. The coastal part arises from the inner surfaces of the cartilages and adjacent parts of the lower six ribs on each side, interdigitating with the transversus abdominis muscle. The lumbar part arises from the medial and lateral lumbar coastal arches and forms the lumbar vertebrae by right and left crura. Now let us learn about the medial lumbocostal arch or the medial arcuate ligament. It is a tendinous arch in the fascia covering the upper part of the psoas major as you can see right here. Medially it is attached to the side of the body of the L1 vertebrae and is continuous with the lateral margin of the corresponding crus. Here is a right crura and here is a left crura. Now laterally it is attached to the front of the transverse process of the L1 vertebra. Now looking at the lateral lumbocostal arch or the lateral arcuate ligament, it is a tendinous arch in the fascia covering the upper part of the quadratus lumborum muscle as you can see right here and here. It is attached medially to the front of the transverse process of the L1 vertebra and laterally to the lower border of the 12th rib right here and here. Now looking at the right crust, it is larger and stronger than the left crust. It arises from the anterolateral surfaces of the bodies of the upper three lumbar vertebrae as you can see right here, this structure. Now the left crust arises from the corresponding parts of the upper two lumbar vertebrae right here. Now, concising the important points, the medial lumbocostal arch or the medial arcuate ligament is a tendinous arch in the fascia covering the upper part of the psoas major muscle. 
medially it is attached to the side of the body of the vertebra L1 and is continuous with the lateral margin of the corresponding cross laterally it is attached to the front of the transverse process of vertebra L1 the lateral lumbocostal arch or the lateral arcuate ligament is a tendinous arch in the fascia covering the upper part of the quadratus lumborum it is attached medially to the front of the transverse process of vertebra L1 and laterally to the lower border of the 12th rib. The right cross is larger and stronger than the left cross. It arises from the anterolateral surfaces of the bodies of the upper three lumbar vertebrae and the intervening intervertebral discs. The left cross arises from the corresponding parts of the upper two lumbar vertebrae. Now let's learn about the muscle fibers of the diaphragm. Now from the circumferential origin that we learnt earlier, the fibers arch upwards and inwards to form the right dome and the left dome as you can see right here. The right dome is higher than the left dome. In full expiration, the right dome reaches the level of the fourth intercostal space. To make it more clear, let's look at it in this diagram. The right dome reaches the level of the fourth intercostal space that is right here whereas the left dome reaches the fifth rib during expiration. Now the central tendon lies at the level of the lower end of the sternum at the sixth coastal cartilage right here. As you can see in this diagram this is the central tendon. Now the downward concavity of the dome is occupied by the liver on the right side and by the fundus of the stomach on the left side. The medial fibers of the right cross run upwards and to the left and encircle the esophagus and in general all the fibers converge towards the central tendon for their insertion. Right here. Now concising the important points under the muscle fibers, from the circumferential origin the fibers arch upwards and inwards to form the right and left domes. The right dome is higher than the left dome. In full expiration, it reaches the level of the fourth intercostal space. The left dome reaches the fifth rib. Now, the central tendon lies at the level of the lower end of the sternum at the sixth coastal cartilage. The downward concavity of the dome is occupied by the liver on the right side and by the fundus of the stomach on the left side. The medial fibers of the right cross runs upward and to the left and encircles the esophagus. And in general, all the fibers converge towards the central tendon for their insertion. Now let's learn about the insertion of the diaphragm that is on the central tendon. The central tendon of the diaphragm lies below the pericardium and it is trilobar in shape made up of three leaflets that is the middle leaflet, the right leaflet and the left leaflet. The middle leaflet is triangular in shape with its apex directed towards the siphoid process. The right and left leaflets are tongue-shaped and curve laterally and backwards, the left being a little narrower than the right, as you can see right here. The central area consists of four well-marked diagonal bands which fan out from a central part of decusation located in front of the opening for the esophagus, right here. Concising the important points under the insertion, the central tendon of the diaphragm lies below the pericardium and it is trilobar in shape made up of three leaflets. The middle leaflet is triangular in shape with its apex directed towards the siphoid process. The right and left leaflets are tongue shaped and curve laterally and backwards, the left being a little narrower than the right. The central area consists of four well-marked diagonal bands which fan out from a central point of decusation located in front of the opening for the esophagus. Now let's learn about the openings in the diaphragm. There are mainly large openings in the diaphragm and small openings. First let's look at the large openings. There are three large openings in the diaphragm. First is the aortic opening, then the esophageal opening and the vena cabal opening. Let's look at the aortic opening. It lies at the lower border of the 12th thoracic vertebrae and it transmits the aorta, the thoracic duct and the azygos vein as you can see right here. Next let's look at the esophageal opening. It lies in the muscular part of the diaphragm at the level of the 10th thoracic vertebra. It transmits the esophagus the gastric or the vagus nerve that you see in yellow, 
the esophageal branches of the left gastric artery and the accompanying veins shown in red and blue. Now let's look at the vena cava opening. It lies in the central tendon of the diaphragm at the level of the 8th thoracic vertebra. It transmits the inferior vena cava, the branches of the right phrenic nerve and the lymphatics of the liver. We need to remember that the aortic opening is seen in the 12th thoracic vertebra. The esophageal opening is seen at the level of the 10th thoracic vertebra and the vena cava opening is seen at the level of the 8th thoracic vertebra. Now in order to remember the level of the openings in the diaphragm, there is a mnemonic that is I8 X10 at 12. Now, I stands for the inferior vena cava opening that is at the level of the 8th thoracic vertebra. E stands for the esophageal opening that is at the 10th thoracic vertebra and A stands for the aortic opening that is at the level of the 12th thoracic vertebra. Now before we move on to the small openings, let's concise the important points under the large or main openings in the diaphragm. The aortic opening is osseoeponeurotic. It lies at the lower border of the 12th thoracic vertebrae. It transmits the aorta, thoracic duct and the azygos vein. The esophageal opening lies in the muscular part of the diaphragm at the level of the 10th thoracic vertebra. It transmits esophagus, the gastric or the vagus nerve, the esophageal branches of the left gastric artery. And finally, the vena cava opening lies in the central tendon of the diaphragm at the level of the 8th thoracic vertebra. It transmits the inferior vena cava, the branches of the right phrenic nerve and the lymphatics of the liver. Now let's look at the small openings in the diaphragm. Each crust of the diaphragm is pierced by the greater and lesser splanchnic nerves. Here you can see this is the right crust and here is the left crust. It is pierced by the greater splanchnic nerve and lesser splanchnic nerve. Similarly, here by the greater and the lesser splanchnic nerves. The left crust is pierced in addition by the hemiazygous vein that you can see in blue right here. Now the sympathetic chain that you see in yellow right here passes from the thorax to the abdomen behind the medial arcuate ligament or the medial lumbosacral arch right here. The subcostal nerves and vessels right here pass behind the lateral arcuate ligament or the lateral lumbosacral arch. Coming to the superior epigastric vessels that you see right here. They pass between the origins of the diaphragm from the xiphoid process and the 7th coastal cartilage and this gap is known as the Larry space or the foramen of Morgagni. Finally, the musculophrenic vessels pierce the diaphragm at the level of the 9th coastal cartilage. Now, concising the important points that are the small openings in the diaphragm, each cross of the diaphragm is pierced by the greater and lesser splanchnic nerves. The left cross is pierced in addition by the hemiazygous vein. The sympathetic chain passes from the thorax to the abdomen behind the medial arcuate ligament or the medial lumbosacral arch. The subcostal nerves and vessels pass behind the lateral arcuate ligament or the lateral lumbosacral arch. The superior epigastric vessels and some lymphatics pass between the origins of the diaphragm from the xiphoid process and the seventh coastal cartilage. And this gap is called the Larry space or the foramen of Morgagni. The musculophrenic vessels pierce the diaphragm at the level of the 9th coastal cartilage. Now let's look at the relations of the diaphragm. Here is the diaphragm. It is related superiorly with the pleura and the lungs and the pericardium. It is related inferiorly with the peritoneum, the liver, the fundus of the stomach, the spleen, the kidneys and the suprarenals. Now we are going to learn about the nerve supply of the diaphragm. First let's look at the motor supply. The phrenic nerves are the sole motor nerves to the diaphragm, that is the ventral C3, C4 and C5 rami. Looking at the sensory supply, the phrenic nerves are sensory to the central part of the diaphragm and the lower six thoracic nerves that cannot be seen in this diagram are sensory to the peripheral part of the diaphragm. To remember it more clearly, the phrenic nerves are sensory to the central part and lower six thoracic nerves are sensory to the peripheral part of the diaphragm. Concising the important points under the nerve supply, 
The motor supply is by the phrenic nerves that are the sole motor nerves to the diaphragm. The sensory supply is the phrenic nerves are sensory to the central part whereas the lower six thoracic nerves are sensory to the peripheral part of the diaphragm. Nextly, looking at the actions of the diaphragm, the diaphragm is the principal muscle of inspiration. On contraction, the diaphragm descends, increasing the vertical diameter of the thorax. The diaphragm acts in all expulsive acts to give additional power to each effort. Thus, before coughing, sneezing, laughing, crying, a deep inspiration takes place. The position of the diaphragm in the thorax depends upon three main factors. First is the elast elastic recoil of the lung tissue that tends to pull the diaphragm upwards. Secondly, on lying down, the pressure exerted by the abdominal viscera pushes the diaphragm upwards. And while standing, the muscles in the abdominal wall contract, increasing the intra-abdominal pressure. Finally, looking at the clinical anatomy of the diaphragm, hiccup is a result of spasmodic contraction of the diaphragm. Shoulder tip pain is a pain in the tip of the shoulder that is due to the irritation of the diaphragm that may cause referred pain in the shoulder because the phrenic and the supraclavicular nerves have the same root values. Diaphragmatic hernia may be congenital or acquired. Finally, eventration is a condition in which diaphragm is pushed upwards due to congenital defect in the musculature of its left half. I hope you found this video helpful. To get the notes of diaphragm as well as other notes of anatomy, physiology, biomechanics and other health science subjects, visit my Instagram page, the link to which is given in the description below. To get updates on my latest videos, click on the subscribe button. To get notifications, tap on the bell icon. Thank you for watching.